So I, I want to make this as informal as possible, um, <laughs> since we're all sitting like this. Uh, so I'm going to ask some questions, but feel free to interject your own questions. I want to make this kind of a free-flowing discussion. Uh, the, the, the title of this discussion is, is supposed to be fostering, how do we foster a startup culture in Arkansas? So before we can talk about you know, making it better, maybe we can talk a little bit about where we are. Um, Grant and Carol, y'all are probably best equipped to answer that, so can you take a stab? Uh, the first thing that occurs is there was a story on the front page of the paper today um, about the fact that the labor force in Arkansas is contracting, and it's contracting very specifically in rural Arkansas. And this is happening at the same time, and in fact, we were set to announce it at, at um, council, legislative council um, yesterday, and then they adjourned the meeting without getting to us. Last year was the largest investment year. 2012 was the largest investment year by businesses into the state of Arkansas in Arkansas's history. Just in the deals that we provided incentives for, and this does not include Big River because not a dollar has been invested yet, we were over $2 billion for the first time in the state's history. In fact, we were well over $2 billion. We were at 2.3. Previous year was 1.7. Um, and again, those are just the deals that we signed incentive agreements on. So that doesn't even capture all the other investment that's going on that we never see. But that's happening at the same time that unemployment remains high and the labor force is contracting because people are tired of looking for work and are stopping. There's a, one really good reason for this, and that is that efficiency is improving. As these companies are dumping tens of millions of dollars into their facilities, they're automating, and they're improving efficiency, and it's taking fewer people to do the same jobs and providing them with higher profits. So I say all that to say that the context for this conversation is really important because startup culture in Arkansas and not just in the urban areas is more critical than it's ever been because the same industries that have powered the state's economy for generations and generations as they return to health aren't employing the same numbers of people and so creating the pipeline and strengthening the pipeline for startup businesses has got to be a bigger and bigger part of what my agency does with what the legislature is concerned about. Um, it, it, it's vital to the future prosperity of the state of Arkansas. Um, do you, are you asking in terms of numbers or? I'm, I'm asking any way that you want to answer. Okay. Well, <laughs> I would say in terms of where the startup community is, is it so much more advanced now than it was five years ago, it's not even funny. Um, and I mainly know about Northwest Arkansas. So if you look, we had basically no seed funding and angel funding available until even maybe three years ago. There was a fund for Arkansas's future in Little Rock, which I think is we, as a state, need to really thank the people who had the vision to put that together. Most of their investment actually was up in Northwest Arkansas, but that was kind of it. And now, if you want angel money, which is early stage money in this state, you can get it. What's 
the problem now is later stage money is not there. So the $2 million, $3 million investments, but there are two funds right now that people have either put together or trying to put together to make investments of that magnitude. What I think has really helped propel our state is some legislation that people like Jerry Adams and James Hendren and some other people that I probably don't know about put together. The equity investment tax credits, R&D tax credits, there are things that reduce the risk for investors and they have been key in the state because it's encouraging people to go and start some of these companies and encourage investors encouraging investors to get off the fence and actually invest their private money in these businesses. So I'm bullish on the future and another thing that I'm very bullish on that I wasn't until even a few months ago is Central Arkansas because my impression was, it, well it wasn't my impression, it's what people from Central Arkansas were telling me is that when you come to Northwest Arkansas it is just different up here. I, I have heard that so many times I can't even begin to tell you it's just different. You get it. You've got this culture. You've got this community and things are going on. Well, lately, what's been going on in Conway has been really impressive. What's been going on in North Little Rock. <laughs> Sorry, I got chastised earlier today for not making that statement. And then when I saw what Warwick was doing, I, was, I almost jumped out of my chair. In fact, I may have. I was so excited to hear about this innovation hub here. And so we've started connecting with some of the other players up in northwest arkansas and i'm just really excited about the future of the state as a whole going from the startup community because i totally agree with grant we cannot do this with old industry it has got to come out of knowledge-based startups work why don't you talk a little bit about what you're doing just because it's so new and to give people some context sure well um i'm the now the executive director of a new uh, entity called the Arkansas Regional Innovation Hub. And in many ways what we're trying to do is uh, replicate uh, a lot of the success of Northwest Arkansas and a lot of similar regions around the country here in Central Arkansas. And we're doing it in sort of, I would say, two distinct ways or phases. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the Argenta Innovation Center, uh, the plans for which have already been announced and it'll be sort of the first physical manifestation, I guess, of what we're trying to accomplish here in Central Arkansas, but it'll have, you know, four main components. One is a co-working space for uh, startup ventures called the Silver Mine. Uh, one is a maker space called the Fab Lab, and we can kind of get into the maker movement uh, a little bit later. Uh, one is the Art Connection, which is a very successful after-school program that's already uh, ongoing uh, with the North Little Rock High School and School District. And then the fourth component will be a STEM education uh, component in the building. And I think what's exciting, though, is after the Innovation Center is going, you know, the programs that we're going to do through the Innovation Center, but also throughout the region in partnership with, you know, all of our friends and, and this ecosystem that already exists here. Because in a nutshell, what I've sort of learned in the last few weeks is I've taken on this new endeavor is that there are so many good things happening in Central Arkansas, so many assets to bring to bear, whether that's in the private sector or through our public institutions like government, um, you know, like the higher education institutions, UAMS, UALR, Pulaski Tech, UCA, uh, and then of course the nonprofits like Winrock International and the programs they have going, the Arkansas Capital Corporation, Fund for Arkansas Future, and, and all of these assets and great talent, it's all here but it needs to be connected, it needs to be organized, it needs to be marketed, and people need to understand, you know, basically how to get from point A to point B if they're an entrepreneur or a startup venture. Because quite frankly, I mean, just to piggyback on what Grant was saying, you know, I think that, you know, if we sit here and we wait for the jobs to come to us, we're gonna be waiting as long as we've been waiting these last few decades. What we need to do is empower people, give them the opportunity to follow their, you know, their ideas, give them the resources they need to accomplish that, and basically make it more efficient for them to find the education, the information, the talent, and the capital to get their startups off the ground. It's a better ROI. Uh, you know, I, I like to say I, I very proudly voted to put the steel plant in uh, Northeast Arkansas during the legislative session, but um, I do think that if we invest as a state in these startup uh, uh, businesses, these small businesses, and we root them here and they grow here, that the ROI and the result as far as economic development is more long-term, it's more sustainable, 
uh, and will have a greater impact uh, on our economy here in central Arkansas. So there's a lot more to it, but the final thing I'll say is just to echo what Carol was saying. I mean, I think that connecting what we do in central Arkansas with the northwest Arkansas community and then trying to branch and grow that around the state to help northeast Arkansas and the Delta and south Arkansas to me is even more exciting. So, I mean, we definitely have to hit our, hit our marks as we grow this, but I certainly think all the potential is there. Well, and, and it's all connected. I mean, to toss it to Matt, I mean, you know, what, we, what we're hoping happens in the Fab Lab and in the maker movement and in the maker space are, you know, companies and products get created that he sells on his platform. I mean, that's what the whole idea is. So, yeah. where are you finding your people? And what do they, you know, I mean, a lot of them are just folks, right? Right, no, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I think, that's a, I think that's a great opportunity for some overlaps of what Argenta and Central Arkansas is working on. Uh, back to your question, Lindsay, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, um, the landscape definitely looks a lot better now than when it did in 2008. I actually used to be working for you and left working for you to go start another company. And in 2008, it was it was a wasteland. I mean, there was there was no support structure. There were no people out there doing it. That you know, it was very it was very very difficult. Um, so to to see what's going on now is very encouraging. It's very hopeful. Um, I still think there's a lot of things we need to be working on that hopefully we'll be able to flesh out through this panel, but we're definitely moving in the right direction, which is very encouraging. Uh, does anybody, has is, is what we've talked about so far inspired any questions so far? Okay, one down here. Are there any plans for any kind of organized um, group that could meet on a like weekly basis or a monthly basis for entrepreneurs? I, I think there certainly are, but one, one of the, the things, and, and I'll let these three talk about this a lot more than I do, um, but everybody I talk to who does what they do, and every study I read and everything, says that top-down is the very worst way to do this stuff. <laughs> and that if I can organize all the stuff I want to organize, and, it, it, and that's why places like the Silver Mine and places like the Iceberg are... Right. go to these things in central Arkansas. Sure. So I just think it would be an opportunity to have a... Yeah, I completely agree. Um, you know, one of the things earlier when you were talking um, was, you know, you're exactly right. You can't do... A top-down strategy does not work at scale, right? Like, you can't build a community just off of a top-down strategy. But one of the things I think we can do that will get to more things like what you're talking about, because I know exactly what you're talking about, is focusing on technology education and consumer science major, uh, computer science majors, like that has got to be a focus. And if we're gonna be able to you know, build bigger communities and have more people in the community, we need to be teaching these things in the colleges and in high school. I thought, I thought there were already uh, like tech drinks, and there are things when I've been down here, uh, but it, like there's just no great organization and there's nothing like on a calendar every single month. And so people see each other at different things, but there's not really an entrepreneurial group that's happening in Central well, Arkansas. Some of what you're talking about doing with your program. That's true. I mean, you know, one of the most exciting things again for me, and I didn't want to talk too long in the first answer, but you know, when we do have the Innovation Center open, the, the programming part is the most exciting in terms of having you know, the regular gatherings, the regular education opportunities, whether those are lectures, TED Talks, bringing speakers in from the outside, having, you know, classes. Uh, we're certainly going to be programming education through the STEM uh, computer lab and laboratory that we have there that will involve coding and programming for people, not only from the, you know, elementary through secondary level, but also adults so that, you know, there can be workforce training, job retraining, and that kind of thing. Uh, formal business incubation programs, uh, accelerator programs like the ARC Challenge that has been really successful in Northwest Arkansas. 
Um, and then, you know, ongoing conferences, startup weekends, the made for few, that, uh, made by few that, that um, uh, has already, again, happened and is ongoing, uh, pitch contests, and, and all of that kind of regular interaction, which becomes even more exciting when you have so much going on in one space, as far as, again, you know, the maker programming intersecting with the arts programming and the STEM education, and then, of course, all the people who are involved in their startups, probably taking advantage of the talent and the people who are getting educated on the one hand and those people getting taken care advantage of the experience that they're able to get you know if you're a high schooler who happens to be particularly talented in coding and you can help a, a startup you know with some you know cheap or free labor but on the on the other hand you're getting you know really great experience that you can take and use you know going forward and so I think all of that interaction will be really exciting and then taking that programming around the region, making sure it's not occurring in one place so that we're working with the technology park when that gets off the ground here in Little Rock and you know all of the good stuff that's going on in Conway and elsewhere. It's important for all of that to not even necessarily be you know, tied to one location but to be shared in this kind of greater ecosystem that we're trying to build and I think that's what's been so great about Northwest Arkansas. Is at this point, we talk about Northwest Arkansas when we talk about the startup community, we don't talk about Fayetteville versus Bentonville or anything like that. And there's a lot of cooperation and it's helped build a brand for that region that's allowed them to retain and attract talent. And that's ultimately the goal. Because, you know, again, the reason why we're doing this is there is a free market at, in play here in the startup community. I mean, Luther, maybe this is a chance for you to finally talk because we know we're losing talent all of the time. And in order to stem that talent, we need to give people real practical opportunities to take their ideas and bring them to fruition here in Arkansas. Otherwise, that free market takes them to the East Coast or the West Coast. And so, you know, Luther, living on the West Coast, you can maybe talk about that and the fact, what we can do here to be successful. Sure, and, and you know, I think part of it, it, it I think there's a lot of, uh, I've got a lot of optimism because it sounds like we've got sort of the primordial soup uh, brewing and, and some of the infrastructure getting put into place. Uh, we, there's some successful programs in Northwest Arkansas and now we're starting to build that out in Central Arkansas and I'm so excited about uh, your, uh, the project you're working on now, how work. But an, another piece of it is going out and studying Silicon Valley and studying Austin and studying these places where uh, the people are organically uh, uh, coming up with these ideas, pulling together the resources, relying on that infrastructure. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be involved with the uh, Arkansas School for Math and Sciences in, in Hot Springs where I went to, to high school and I think that that's uh, where I kind of got the, really turned into a computer nerd and really started uh, caring a lot about like internet technology and uh, I would love for nothing else than to just take an airplane full of those kids to Google headquarters and Facebook headquarters and walk them through and get those kids inspired and, and have them thinking about, uh, you know, you have the opportunity to do uh, this, that, or the other, but really the um, working for a company like this is the future. I mean, this whole internet thing is not going away. So if you can, if we can get, if we can just tap some of that mojo, uh, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not under any illusions that we'll be able to uh, create a clone of Silicon Valley in, in Little Rock uh, or North Little Rock, but, um, but there's a lot of stuff that, that Arkansas and our leaders could be doing. I mean, I, I, as the public policy director at Yelp, I get, when any kind of government official sends our CEO something, uh, it gets kicked over to my desk. And so the other day, I got this FedEx package put on my chair because my CEO saw it was from Governor Bob McDonnell, uh, state of Virginia. And so I opened it up and it was uh, an iPod touch. It was just an iPod touch in a box, no explanation, whatever. And I click play and it's a video of Governor Bob McDonnell saying, hi Jeremy, I'm Governor Bob McDonnell. Let me, t let me make a pitch to you about why you should uh, put a call center in the state of Virginia. And so these, these other states, you know, this is a competitive landscape. These other states are thinking about how do, how do we tap that uh, Silicon Valley mojo? How do we make these creative and direct appeals to these executives to, uh, to, to put that uh, into place? So I think that could be um, an area of improvement for us as well. You got to step it up, Grant, get some iPod touches. <laughs> I'd be surprised at some of the things we've done. 
Uh, well, let, let's talk, let's step back a little bit and talk about um, some of the, the startup, successful startup ecosystems that you mentioned. Can we try to define some of the qualities that those have and, you know, maybe we agree that you can't engineer a startup culture from the top down, but um, maybe you can kind of build up some of the individual pieces. You gotta put the tools in place. And that's what I was referring to when I said, you know, it never works, particularly when the government says, hey, here we are, follow me. Uh -uh. But what we can do is, you know, the things that we've been doing, we can, you know, nobody talked about it, but ADC paid the rent at the iceberg for the first year, um, just so it would be there. Um, and, you know, Warwick and the folks who were working on the, the North Little Rock side were in the office last week saying, you know, we're gonna need a little help. Um, and, you know, we have, in the last two years, um, put up an extra prize at the Art Challenge um, and we're going to help with the funding to bring the Art Challenge to Central Arkansas. So there are things that we can do. Um, and this may not be the right place to interject this, but Lindsay and I have been round and round on this subject. Um, we're talking about the entrepreneurial pipeline and we're talking about startups. And invariably, and particularly invariably, when you end up with a panel with these two guys on it, we start talking about internet technology platform startups. And certainly, they're important. We got to do everything we can to create an environment where those folks can thrive. There are lots and lots and lots of startups and lots and lots and lots of very, very high tech startups in Arkansas that have very little to do with internet technology. And one of my frustrations as somebody who's been sitting on the sidelines is that, and they're all my friends, but my, my friends and colleagues who have been trying to work this whole tech park thing out, have done a woefully inadequate job from the very first moment they opened their mouths to explain what the tech park is, what it should be, and why we need it. Because, you know, as Lindsay pointed out a year ago, you know, when he interviewed Luther among others, for what these guys do, why do we need a $22 million structure somewhere? The problem is the people who are wanting to build the tech park and the people who are wanting to use the tech park don't do what these guys do. You know, they're, they're making nano coatings for, for airplane wings. You know, they're taking tech coming out of UAMS, UALR, U of A, and trying to commercialize it. Part of the problem we've got right now is, I hesitate to say this, but we're breaking the law in some spots because we're doing commercial work in labs paid for by the federal government. We gotta get some space outside of our universities where some of these guys can do this work. But Nobody's told you all any of that, I don't think, very effectively until just this minute. The best description I heard of the tech park was an, was an IT hostel. I heard someone actually say, we're trying to build an IT hostel where roving computer programmers can come and spend the night. And it's just a it's just complete disconnect with any, any reality, right. not even one that actually exists. Maybe you should tell the tech park yeah. before. But I, have. I, I want to say one, one thing, though, that I think and I, I feel like I say this all the time, but going back to your question about looking at other successful, you know, startup communities, uh, I mean, any, just any um, diverse business communities, the biggest thing they have in common is they have big successes, right? They have big wins. And until Central Arkansas, Arkansas as a whole, 
has a big win around that that returns money to investors in arkansas it's going to be it's going to be a it's going to tough climb it's a tough hill to climb i mean because it's not a lack of money in arkansas as far as investable capital it's really a lack of understanding okay i have two hundred thousand dollars i want to invest do i want to buy a subway franchise or do i want to invest it in like you know some nano tech company right and right now everyone in arkansas not everyone the majority of traditional arkansas investors are going to say you know what i like subway sandwiches and I will eat there every day for lunch, so I'm gonna put my money there. Well, and to, to Warren Buffett's point, I understand Subway exactly. sandwiches. I don't understand this other stuff. And, you know, as an investor, I'm gonna invest my money in, in something I get. I wanna talk about the tech park, because, uh, you know, Lindsay and I have also talked about this, and I think about sort of where we're dropping the ball as, as, a, as a state and as a community and, and fostering innovation in Arkansas. And I'm curious to you, Matt, because Matt Price is a deep inspiration to me. I mean, I, I think, you know, there's, it, there's one thing to talk about, you know, getting a, a ping pong table and a keg and, you know, just coming back to Arkansas and, make, and poaching some Axiom guys and making a go at it, but the, you're actually doing it. And so my question to you would be, is there, uh, you know, if there were uh, a reclaimed space on Main Street downtown that you know some of this 22 million uh, went toward where the space where uh, Matt Price can walk in, uh, put his laptop on a pod with you know a developer and, and give it a go. I mean, and, and you have the, the sort of free space, you filled out an application. Is that something you would take advantage of? If it was free space, yes. <laughs> I mean, right, yeah, I mean, real easy. Like right now, I mean, we have, we have real bottom lines that we have to meet and and it's yeah. not my place to make this announcement because it's not my project but i think that there there've been enough howling in that direction that people are beginning to understand that that's necessary it's needed and i'm fairly certain we'll see an announcement sooner rather than later now that creates a whole nother set of challenges which warwick and i have been talking about for weeks now is We've had too many years of this river somehow dividing ambitions, and that's got to stop. And what we're building on the North Little Rock side and what may eventually get built on the Little Rock side have to find ways to be complementary and not competitive. You know, we've got pedestrian bridges. <laughs> you can work on both sides of the river. You could drive if you wanted to. Um, but you could walk. And so, you know, a and at the same time, if we end up with similar space in Little Rock and North Little Rock, how are we going to integrate the guys in Conway who are also really doing some cool stuff up there? All of this stuff has to complement not, I mean, competition at some level is critical to the entrepreneurial pipeline. But in our, our infancy, like we are, the last thing we need is, you know, the innovation center over there fighting with whatever this thing ends up getting called to, you know, say, well, you're not going to do this, we're going to do this. It just well, doesn't make any sense. And in general, we need to think about, you know, how we're perceived from the outside. I mean, the average person really doesn't, who's not from here, doesn't understand the difference between Little Rock and North Little Rock. I mean, they're where there's a river, yes, but otherwise, I mean, it's a metropolitan area, and the main street of North Little Rock has more in common with the main street of Little Rock than the main street of Little Rock has to, in common with West Little Rock, quite frankly. And as far as people will perceive that, um, you know, it's a very small metropolitan area. You know, we're, we're lucky uh, if we can say this MSA has a million people in it, and that's counting Conway and Pine Bluff and Benton and Bryan and Lone Oak and Cabot, and we can say we've got a million people here. And one reason why we're going to have to work well together, too, is because we're a state of three million people, which is smaller than most major metropolitan areas in the country. And so we need to kind of consider the landscape that we're working in when we're trying, again, to retain and attract talent. And then to speak more specifically, um, you know, great uh, places, great cities.
And so I guess what I was going to get to was specifically for this area, um, you know, we have a, the potential for a technology park, and I want to kind of dig into a little bit of what Grant talked about, which is that you know, we can identify sectors of the economy here in Central Arkansas where we have uh, the potential for real growth, like you know, the biosciences, the biometrics, the nano research that's going on at UAMS, the big data stuff that's happening at Axiom and all of that. And especially with the research at UAMS and UALR, those actually need sophisticated wet lab of laboratories that are going to require the kind of investment that the $22 million from the sales tax makes possible. That's a very, very different kind of atmosphere and facility than what we're proposing to do with the Innovation Center, which is a lot more simple and straightforward. And, um, and again, they're complementary, not competitive in any way, shape, or form. And so if you get back to the idea that you know, we want to portray this area as one that's vibrant, that has more than one thing going, that can kind of handle the ecosystem that we're trying to build. You have a tech park, you have an innovation sector, uh, center, hopefully you have other co-working spaces and accelerator programs that start to spring up so that there's, there's a sense of vibrancy. Yeah. And, the, and the last thing I'll say just real quick is, you know, Northwest Arkansas has done a great job of really building their startup community around their core competencies, you know, the, the retail sector and logistics. Uh, and logistics, and and they've been very successful with that. So I think we need to do that here in Central Arkansas. Well, and one of the things that we were talking about the other day, bioinformatics is going to be one of the areas here in in the Little Rock, North Little Rock metropolitan area um, where we've got the opportunity to really do sort of world leading kind of stuff. Um, and this is how a space like Warwick's or what we're talking about happening in Little Rock fits into that. You can have really great programmers and, you know, Axiom folks, and people like that, sitting around in a space like this, working on algorithms and coming up with ideas for how you treat this data to get the kinds of information you want out of it. But when it's time to actually put that thing in process and you're dealing with live medical data from live human beings, you're going to need a hardened facility somewhere behind all kinds of security. And that's when you migrate it into a facility either attached to a university or in a tech park to say, okay, you know, if we're going to take the 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 um, genome from every cancer patient who's ever been through the uh, through the the uh, cancer center out there, particularly in the um, realm of multiple myeloma, uh, and put it all into this database, we're not going to give it to some guys with a ping pong table and a keg. <laughs> we don't have a ping pong table. <laughs> uh, so earlier, Carol talked about the school of innovation that, that she's um, studying the creation of, creating at, at the University of Arkansas. And she asked people to suggest what the best outcomes of that would be. Um, I don't think a lot of people got what she was going for, but uh, maybe we could do that for just startup culture generally. We sort of go around here first and then kick it to the audience. Um, I don't know how far we want to look, say five years down the road, what, what sort of are some, what are some examples of, of out, like the best possible outcomes that, that you can imagine? Well, to all, I'll just sort of pass the mic. I, I just want, want to start yeah, I just want to reiterate with what I brought up earlier is we've got to get more computer scientists. I mean, it's just, it's an absolute necessity. And that applies to all, you know, bioinformatics, consumer web, big data, open data, all that sort of stuff. I don't necessarily need to be a computer scientist. I'm a web developer, but I have a graphic design degree. And I think anybody can learn to code if they just want to learn. I don't think you have to go to college. Yeah, totally. And, and I think that turns a lot of people off when you say computer scientist. They don't, it, they glaze right over. But when you say learn to code or, you know, they're so, 
you know, used to being on their phones and things like that. I think we've got to come up with a different vocabulary to get people interested in learning how to be web developers or designers or things like that. Sure. I, so. I, I completely agree with that sentiment. And a couple of folks that actually work for us are of that mind. I mean, it's like, I totally agree. But I, but I will also, I'll give you a counterpoint. Everyone that works at Google has a PhD in computer science. Well, like, and it's, true, and, and, right, but that's a, that's a massively successful technology company. And I'm pretty sure Yelp has a bunch of those too. And that, oh, yeah. That there's, there's a sure. Like me. Sure. Absolutely. I, I'd say, kind of to piggyback on Matt's point, that you know, there, this competition is so fierce in Silicon Valley among uh, various uh, companies, and that's why it's such a draw. If you, if you got it, I mean, I think about uh, kids that are graduating from the math science school today. I mean, they're going out of state, and they're uh, then getting one hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar starting pay at, at Google or Facebook, and and they take one of those jobs and. Uh, the Twitter recruiters calling them every day trying to bump their salary and so uh, what I would do I mean what I guess what I would love is some type of radical um, shakeup of the of uh, ninth through twelfth grade and even maybe you start earlier where we're making sure that young people who already are treat technology is already ubiquitous part of their life so it's not and, and they can relate to you know the uh, these consumer products work backwards from Instagram or Snapchat or uh, Facebook and tell those stories and so how do, what what exactly goes into the building of an app like Snapchat or Instagram and develop curriculum around that and you're right like you don't have to be a PhD in computer science they're they're great initiatives and great movements now in education like Code Academy and uh, uh, you know you can a lot of online learning courses but you know, I read the other day that like cursive handwriting is finally being phased out. I mean, I, I, I can't. I mean, in the places where it's not phased out, I don't know if that's the case in most Arkansas schools. But I mean, why the hell are we wasting kids' time having them write cursive when that that's you know that's a squandered opportunity to to tell kids a really cool story about uh, how they can build uh, uh, internet products. And I think that I, I use the internet very broadly, but I, the internet is going to be everywhere. It's going to be, and I and I think that. You could, uh, there could be some uh, um, encryption that allows the guys with the keg and the startup to do uh, bioinformatics uh, research and, and pattern analysis. There's no reason. In fact, I think we should be thinking the opposite. I think we should uh, be, uh, you know, allowing them to, to play with that data as much as possible, anonymized appropriately, of course. But like that's uh, that's how you do it. Is you you really have to restructure the uh, the education and get people excited about. Uh, it, let them start with the products that they love and they're already using. Uh, work backwards uh, in terms of you know, how was that product built exactly? What skills did you have to learn? And then develop curriculum out of that um, and systematize it and get it in as many, to as many young people in Arkansas as possible. And that's why we're, we, to your very point, we, we are so focused right now on this STEMWorks initiative and on changing high school in the well, and changing not only high school, but schools all the way back, you know, a whole bunch more project-based learning. I mean, using Project Lead the Way, using High Tech High School, using, you know, all of these models that basically are, are designed to do exactly what Luther's talking about, to, to start with the cool idea and start breaking it down backward and saying, okay, you know, you got to learn the process. Um, I want to start off by saying I take a little bit of issue with the cursive because <laughs> I have read that there's research that shows it's important for brain development, oddly enough. But to your question about what would success of an entrepreneurial ecosystem look like, success to me would be when smart people start moving to this state rather than out of this state. I want to remind you all that we're making a big leap when we talk about technology education because a whole lot of this state has inadequate broadband. Um, it it, it may be here in Conway, North Little Rock, and Little Rock, but it's not in Helena, West Helena. Right. Well, we've got a huge study going on that is including everybody in it and aiming toward this next um, fiscal session. 
try and figure out how we start solving some of that problem, starting first with the school buildings. Um, and, you know, interestingly enough. But even the pipelines to the town. Well, you know, the I mean, but see, that's where we, we start to get confused because you, you look, we got backbone coming out of our ears. We don't have connections. I mean, you know, we, we've got trunks upon trunks upon trunks. Well, a great example, Bentonville High School on the national rankings and the way they're encouraging us to think about broadband for schools doesn't have enough broadband. Bentonville High School, they're running the largest databases in the United States in Bentonville, Arkansas, larger than the Department of Defense's. There's adequate broadband under the high school in Bentonville. We're just not connecting the high school to it. So it's... it's the bank people can't upload the databases that I send, send them, I Southern Bancor, in um, West Helena. I know. But it's not because we don't have the long haul fiber all over everywhere. It's the connections that we lack. And that's what we've got to work on. Thank you. Uh, I want to give you some insight I've got with regarding students and programming in high school. I've been pretty fortunate um, to be connected with high schools throughout the state through the East Initiative. And last week, I kid you not, seven students emailed me all ready to learn app programming. Some of them have already started it, some of them already built an app. So their attention is there. They're really ready to start learning how to code. So that's one thing I'm doing with some of my time is, is trying to give back to these schools and talk to them about programming and the careers in programming. So uh, October, I'm talking to 120 kids about a career within mobile development and what they need to be doing to prepare for that. So um, if any of you want to talk to me later about what I'm doing there and you know, if we want to help each other to kind of continue growing that, just please just come reach out to me. So we're providing the funding to put East Lab into lots and lots more schools. Hi, Mattia Fleischner, I'm class nine at Clinton School, and I'm really interested in learning more about a little bit more about Innovation Lab. I had the opportunity to help open Hub Boulder, um, which is a national and international network of co-working spaces to for professionals trying to make a social impact. And I think one of, one of the things that's very valuable there is that you have this huge network of different co-working spaces, right? And I think one thing, being from Hot Springs, Arkansas, is sometimes Arkansas can feel isolated from the outside community and innovation going on in the outside community that inspires people locally. And I'm just interested in hearing if you have a vision for connecting innovation, the innovation lab you're creating to maybe other innovation labs in the United States or maybe internationally. I mean, absolutely. I've, I'm three weeks into the job, so it's going to take a little bit, you know, of time. And I'm kind of thinking, you know, in the metropolitan area and then expanding out to the counties and working with Carol to make sure that we're connecting up the state. But um, certainly, I mean, I think that what's been it's both you know, an advantage and a disadvantage uh, is that Central Arkansas is a little bit late to this. Um, all it takes is a very rudimentary Google search to find out about these similar initiatives happening in basically every city and every region in the country. And, and you know, even in our own state, Northwest Arkansas is way ahead of Central Arkansas. The advantage of that, though, is we get to avoid some of the mistakes and pitfalls that other places have experienced, and we get to perfect it. And, and make it better. And you know, we know about the Idea Village in New Orleans and um, similar efforts in places like Birmingham, Alabama, Nashville, Tennessee, our friends in Texas and Tulsa. And I think that you know, it's gonna be very you know, uh, intuitive and, and obvious for us to kind of expand in that direction. And so that's certainly a goal for us, but we definitely wanna take it in stages for sure. But thank you. Other questions? Um, you know, to, to sort of piggybacking on the point that um, was made about just sort of the basic infrastructure, you know, a lot of times when we talk about tech startups, whether they're internet-based or, um, you know, hard science, 
you know, we're, we're talking about people who obviously have a lot of education, um, you know, maybe they haven't come from means and, and they've just been good students, but how do we make sure that, and I know this is something that Carol has, has uh, done some work in, into, how do we make sure that uh, when we're having this conversation, we're not leaving behind huge chunks of our state citizens? That's a hard question, I know. So. Well, I know that, but at least what we're trying to do with the Innovation Center is the hope is that the community aspect of it will be one that's welcoming to really anybody who has a small business idea and that the idea is that you can walk in and get connected to the resources that are available already through existing programs. I mean, you know, meetings I've done this month with, for instance, the Small Business Administration and, and with Grant and with the folks at the Capital Corporation, uh, there are these programs that are out there that people don't even know about in terms of, you know, uh, assistance for starting a small business. And so I think having a place, again, that's not a, frankly, not a tech park, but a place where people feel very welcome and that they're invited because of the events and the programming and, you know, just the nature of the space to be able to come in almost like a public library. But, you know, it's an innovation center and there are a lot of different components to it. And also, I think this is an invitation for me to just speak a little bit more about the maker space, because I referred to that earlier, but, you know, there's a, there's a maker movement happening in the country, and in a nutshell, it's people who, you know, want to get back to actually making things in the United States, you know, through, you know, whether it's you know, small or, or large manufacturing. And, um, you know, the maker space in the Innovation Center will have things like 3D printers and advanced laser etching machines and other equipment, along with education and sort of oversight so that, you know, young people can come in and create, you know, prototypes of inventions, but also uh, anybody, I mean, an adult, you know, after work or somebody who tinkers in their garage, but who doesn't have access to the kind of equipment that would allow them to really uh, manifest their idea. And when you think about the fact that we have really, again, very skilled people working at places like Dassault Falcon or at Caterpillar or at Baldor Steel, but they're not allowed to use that equipment, obviously, for their own purposes in their spare time. But they're, they can come in and, and, you know, see if this idea will work. And if it does work, they can go literally across the hallway to somebody who can create an e-commerce platform or advise them on how to kind of bring that into fruition as a small business. Uh, and again, with the STEM education component, you know, it's, it's just, there's a lot of opportunity for people who aren't necessarily high tech or internet based to start a small business. And I think that's critical. And, and I'll make one more like massive leap just because it, it's been an idea that, I mean, has come up just as I've been talking about this over the last few weeks. And I know you had a panel about, you know, the parole system uh, at 2 p.m. today. You know, if you think about it, one of the problems with our parole system is that people who go on parole can't get jobs most of the time because they have a criminal record, right? So you're stuck in a catch-22 and you're basically incentivized to go back to whatever it was that probably got you in jail in the first place. One answer to that may be, and I'm not suggesting it's perfect, but, you know, if you can't get a job, start your own business if you've got an idea. But how do we enable these people to start their own business and to be an entrepreneur, we need to have places where people can actually see a pathway from idea to fruition, and we need more places like an innovation center. Lindsay, it, it's interesting. The, the problem you identify is not just a problem here. It's a problem in Palo Alto, California. There was a great article, I think it was The Economist last month, that said, it, of the startups that were funded in the last five years in Palo Alto and Silicon Valley, s north of 60% of them were started by someone from Stanford, Harvard, or MIT, who also had a c personal connection to somebody in a VC firm through their attendance at those schools. So, you know, we, we like to think of this channel as a meritocracy. N not so much. Um, although, you know, the, the final point of the article was, if you're one of the 35%, you know, 
know, you bet you got a lights out idea, man, <laughs> because somehow you managed to break through. You know, your idea is so fantastic. One of the things that we've started looking at along these lines is, you know, in Cambridge, in Palo Alto, the competition is so fierce. The A++ ideas are the ones that are getting funded. We've started sending people up there to talk to folks who have just the solid A idea or maybe even the A- minus idea that can't break through and say, well, what if we funded you? And all you got to do is move your idea to Arkansas. Why not? Now, there are other states doing that as well. So, oh, yeah. you know, Kentucky has a 50% grant, I think it is, or tax credit now. That they're trying to recruit our students. Cyclewood went to Dallas. They had to because of their investors. But I think um, in terms of leaving people out, there are some people who are trying to do some innovative things in education, like what you're talking about, the science, arts, um, math and science school. But what Chad talked about earlier today with Noble Impact, I, this summer I thought it was really amazing because most of the kids they worked with, I think, it wasn't restricted to kids from lower means, but my impression is that's what most of them came from. And they were really engaged with this social entrepreneurship and they built a lot of skills and I think saw the potential for how they might develop businesses in the future. And if we can do more of this project-based, hands-on education, I think Steve Clark's just a real visionary in terms of trying to get some of this going. I think that could help some. Okay. That's exactly a place that and Matt and I talked about this five years ago. And unfortunately, the, the uh, economy just blew up on us. Um, we're sitting in a building here that is designed to create the CEOs of NGOs. That's what this is a factory to build. One of the places that we ought to be able to lead here in Arkansas is in social entrepreneurism. We got the feedstock like nobody else and the reputation. I've been begging. One of the things I think we ought to do, you know, along the lines of a tech park, if we could buy a small office building, the state, and say to NGOs, tell you what we're gonna do. We'll give you, we'll pay your electricity, we'll give you the space rent free, we'll pay your internet and your telephone. Start your NGO here. But it's not, it's not just an NGO. I think we got to be careful about that. Um, because, you know, this is a school of social impact right. in all reality. Whether, that, whether that's an NGO or a, or a for profit or, or in this state, a B Corp. Sure. Which gives you a significant amount of leverage these days because there's only 700 B Corps. Right. I'm actually surprised it took us this long to get to this topic of social impact because of where we're sitting and also what we can leverage. I mean, yeah. whether that be 40 master's students a year, I don't know what that is. Um, you know, my class was 29. But keeping those people here to me is sure. a pretty significant impact and that goes back to Jamie Fugit's art. And understand I was using NGO as sort of a catch-all for... Yeah, yeah. for well, I'll tell you, you know, I talked to Dave Knox, who is co-founder of the Brandery in Cincinnati, and I was talking to him about these um, social um, incubators, right? And there's really only one good one. It's in Boulder. And he said, there's a tremendous upside to starting these uh, incubators and accelerators around social impact. This place and this space to me should be... Um, what design is to Stanford and what business is to Harvard, that's what social impact should be to Little Rock and the Clinton School of Public Service. I mean, you're going to get a bigger name on a place? I mean, I, so to me, there's a tremendous upside, absolutely insane. And when you go back to talking about high school, tremendous upside to that. There's nobody, 
is there a high school incubator in, in, the, in the United States? Because I promise you, there's already 13-year-olds getting funded, right? Because they already, there's, they're going to know more tech than we do. And so, why can't we do that? I mean, we can. That's the crazy part to me, is that there, we can do that. We can do that here. And the, the thing that I, I'm afraid of a little bit is, I just, I feel this underpinning of a tough culture. When we can't agree across, across a river, you know, okay, we can build all we want, but if we can't come to the same table and talk about these things. You know, I mean, everybody wants the best for this place. This could be the boulder of, of the South, I think. And if we talk about Brad Feld and the four startup community deals, and you know, I mean, this could be the boulder of the South. The Especially connection-wise. One of the really smart things that I think the North Little Rock guys have done is to hire a guy oh, yeah. who is identified with the Little Rock side and has a business <laughs> on the Little Rock side and represents constituents on the Little Rock side. So, you know, he's now got a vested interest in both sides. And then, you know, hopefully since I'm not didn't grow up here and I don't I didn't go to Central and I didn't go to North Little Rock High and not, I don't really care whether the people across the river don't like the people on this side or the people on this side you know I mean I sort of feel like we're into the star bellied sneeches and the non star bellied sneeches at this point but I think that's part of how this is gonna work we got people who don't have an axe to grind, who are just going to try and figure out how to make it work. I didn't, I didn't catch your name, but your comment, I think, was really, uh, really good because I, I, from, you know, we're we're consumer web. It's you know weird and doesn't make a lot of sense a lot of times. But like, I think a lot of people associate the tech startup scene with just consumer web startups, which is not very fair. You know, it's an extremely limiting perspective. And it's also very frustrating in that same vein that everyone says, oh, we just want to be the next Silicon Valley, which is a ridiculous, ridiculous thing to say. Um, but I think Little Rock and Central Arkansas need to play on its strengths to have its own identity. And I think you've probably just nailed one of the biggest opportunities and strengths that we might have. And I've never even thought about that, but I mean, you're, you're exactly right. I think we uh, have time for maybe one more question and final thoughts. Let me, uh, Pat Hayes used to be the mayor of North Little Rock, but let me just deal a little bit with uh, what may have gotten more emphasis than it deserves, although there is some of that element there. Uh, one of the most significant things that I had a chance to be a part of when I was at City Hall was the combination of Little Rock Water and North Little Rock Water departments, which now is Central Arkansas Water and is really building a terrific foundation for a regional water system that is doing some pretty incredible things. In order to do that, it took University of Arkansas at Little Rock to do a study that, that recommended from a technical standpoint how much better that the two utilities combined would be. And there was all the politics that was associated with the North and the South and, and those sort of things. The second thing was the Greater Little Rock Chamber under the leadership of Joe Ford uh, uh, was very strong advocate and Joe's comment was, I got all tell folks on both sides of the river, it really doesn't make any difference to me where my customers are, they're customers. So, you know, all that culminated with Little Rock Board of Directors voting unanimously to raise the rates on their citizens or at least keep them, because uh, we were paying twice the amount of, of uh, for our water is what Little Rock was doing. And they unanimously voted to, uh, you know, essentially raise the rates on their voters and to lower them or keep them stable on our voters. Uh, which was a terrific statement for regionalism in terms of what we all needed and in long range, not short range, which was so, you know, Central Arkansas Transit, uh, we've got the combination of the bridges, but even lines with the county. So while there may be some, we'll say, a little bit of sore spots here and there, and, and, and there's a, a good amount of energy that has gone into those, and we'll go into those, there's certainly, you know, with uh, uh, not only with MIMS and Central Arkansas Transit, but there's a multitude of things that underline the pinning of the fact that regional is the way to do it. Uh, and yet there may be a hiccup here or two, or here or there, but overall, you know, we have a very strong regional backbone that is underlined by 
a, a strong sense in the business community. Uh, I know Warren Stevens has been a strong advocate, you know, for, uh, you know, I mean, he looked over on the north side of the river and, in fact, invested six million dollars in buying the land that Dickey Stevens Ballpark is on. So I, I don't want to underpin too much the fact that we are in some competition, but on, on, on the bottom line, what, what Warwick said, you know, is that we are too small to slice and dice uh, and not to coordinate our efforts. So I just wanted to make sure that we didn't come out here with a little bit too much of a perspective of north-south. Uh, you know, we, we, we ended the Civil War a long time ago. <laughs> uh, any final thoughts from our panelists? Anything that we didn't talk about that you guys want to mention quickly? Well, thanks so much, panelists. Uh, thank you all for coming. I uh, really appreciate the Clinton School for hosting, and we hope you'll come back next year. Thanks. Thank you.